welcome to um, our fireside chat. We seem to be missing a fire, but that's because it's a very warm day and we don't need one. Um, sorry. Um, I want to um, have each of the panelists introduce themselves. And then I am going to ask um, a series of questions, and then we're going to open it up um, to the audience. So if you could, um, for each of the panelists, starting with Chris, if you could state your name, what you do, and just a little bit about whatever you think is relevant for them to know about you. Should I use this? Gary, or that one, whichever one. Okay, great. So uh, I'm Chris Wiggins. I'm a professor here. I've been on the faculty in the engineering school for 15 and a half years. Uh, in applied mathematics. Uh, and then for the last several years, I've also split my time between Columbia and the New York Times, where I'm directing a data science group there. Hi, I'm Rachel Lamaski. I am at Weibo Conversion right now, which is a small startup. We're trying to figure out whether for a given web page, people will do the thing that you want them to do on it better than an alternative. So will they register for a class? Will they request more information? This is called conversion in the marketing world. Before that, I was at Opera Solutions. We were doing machine learning consulting, trying to do things like predict who was going to use a coupon, which clients were going to leave the company, who was going to request a first class upgrade, things of that sort. Hello, my name is Eric Brown. I'm uh, with IBM Watson Health. I'm a computer scientist with a background in information retrieval and question answering. Uh, I've spent uh, my entire career at IBM, most of that time, the first 18 years in the research division, uh, working on text analytics, information retrieval, question answering. Uh, I had the pleasure of being involved in our Watson Jeopardy Grand Challenge problem from start to finish. And today, I direct a team, uh, primarily development, but also a little bit of research that sits in between our Watson Health Business Unit and the IBM Research Division with uh, responsibility for incubating and piloting technology and sort of shepherding it along out of research into our offerings and solutions. Uh, thank you all. So um, Chris, yeah. you get the first question. Uh, my question is, what has been the largest challenge in building the organizational capability to handle data at the New York Times? Sure. So one important challenge is um, a company thinks they want a data scientist, and they don't have all the data engineering ready yet. So um, I, I showed up at the New York Times. As, uh, so I, I went when I, in the spring of 2013, I was trying to decide what to do for a sabbatical. And thanks to a colleague here who um, Mark Hansen, who many of you know, actually did the lobby art in the New York Times. So he, he knew lots of people at the New York Times. So, uh, so I met some people there, and I said, you know, here's my background in using machine learning in biology. So trying to use machine learning to help biologists who have lots and lots of data and are trying to answer natural science questions using data. How might this be useful here? And part of the reception was, well, we just created a BI group. So the New York Times had just, you know, it's, the, the company's been around since 1851. They just created a, a BI group in 2012 to centralize all the various data warehousing. And included in that was um, tracking digital events. So tracking every digital event is, is, is one of the reasons that data science has blossomed as a career choice, because any company has a website. And when you have a website, you have abundant data about how your customers or readers interact with your product. So um, the New York Times had worked really hard to acquire all the data about people interacting with the site. There's a lot of work to be done to make those data um, accurate, accessible, reliable to data scientists, to data analysts, um, to other people who want to sort of make sense of the product using data. And so that, that began you know, sort of a, a saga of kicking the tires on many different ways of organizing our data. And, it's, and there's a lot of really, um, really important engineering work to be done before you try to do any data science. Like, particularly if you're doing it at web scale, it's, there's a lot of engineering. So we went through uh, an Amazon solution, uh, a Hive solution, a Redshift solution, uh, and eventually this past year have been transitioning a lot of our data engineering into um, Google Cloud, which has made it, um, made it a lot easier for data analysts and data scientists alike to get the data. So one big challenge to doing data science as a company is if you haven't done the data engineering yet, because there's no point trying to build some sort of 
it's like trying to make a fancy fountain and you haven't built the pipes yet. Like you need to get the foundation right to make sure that the data are available and accurate. Um, so that was one transition and I think any company is gonna go through that. A separate sort of spectrum, our challenges is working with people who organize themselves around a craft. And, and by craft, I mean, you know, the, the New York Times is organized around the craft of journalism, and, and that's sort of also a, a business differentiator. It's, it's a mission, and it, and it keeps people motivated, but it's also a business differentiator. And I say that because in addition to people not wanting me to replace any editors or journalists with, you know, data or algorithms, it would also be bad for business because, you know, anybody, well, not anybody, but, you know, there, other companies could go hire a bunch of good data scientists and write interesting journalism algorithms, but if you already have really good journalists who have really perfected the craft, maybe you should make sure that they, that you don't mess with that. So that's another challenge for integrating data science into any company is to figure out how are you going to integrate it into existing process. So if you build a new startup and it's data science oriented from the start, then you won't have this challenge. Or if you're working for a company that's not sort of organized around some, some, some craft, again, that there's a set of people who do it well. Um, they are the people who adjudicate whether other people are doing it well. You know, it's a bit like academics. If you go in and tell professors, I'm gonna do some data science and I'm gonna promote you if you get this many grants or papers or any other metric, scientists, myself included, will say, no, I'm a special snowflake. You can't quantify my, um, my craft. So similarly, uh, you know, it, it's, that's, a, that's a cultural challenge of going into an organization and saying, we are going to use data to help you and not, and not to replace you. So that's sort of a, a tech challenge and a people challenge. Uh, thank you. Um, Rachel, so our community um, uh, invest, invents new methods every day, um, new machine learning algorithms, new data science algorithms. Um, in your experience at Opera, uh, did you need complicated methods or did simple ones suffice? And pick your favorite application. So I think a lot of what the machine learning community is doing is making more predictive algorithms, which is certainly important. But a lot of what we needed to do was make more descriptive algorithms. One, for the obvious reason that we wanted to know why, right? So I'm going to pick a large retail drugstore um, that used to have receipts that were extremely long, and now their receipts are shorter. Um, not sh I, don't, I don't know if you have it here. I think you probably do. Every, everything is in New York, right? Um, and so what they wanted to do was predict who was going to use a coupon. Predictive algorithms are, are great for that, right? But not just who, but why, right? Who was, who was using it? Why were they using it? Who was not using it? In some cases, actually, it was good that someone wasn't using it. Um, so there's a, a population of people who go to the drugstore because they have the coupon, but then forget to use it. <laughs> Those are really good customers, right? <laughs> All right, and so... You know, we could make something that predicted very well we were using a deep autoencoder, and then we would go to the drugstore executives, right? These are, these are people who are in general sort of the MBA track and not the PhD track. And then they would say, well, I've been doing this for 40 years. Either you're telling me something I already know, but why, right? How do I change my business to make more people use it, right? And once we were, we gave them a decision tree, right? Not super predictive, but we could put that in front of their face in a PowerPoint and they understood it, right? And then they would say, oh, that makes sense. Yes, actually this cluster that you're seeing here are people who have prescriptions. So they only use their coupon every 30 days when they come back in. Not only do we have more information about our business, but we sort of believe you now that you're doing the right thing because your, your tree makes sense to us or your bunch of trees, right? So we started, ended up, because we could understand what was in the model, we would not just build, you know, one for who was going to use our coupon, but we had the prescription people. My favorite one was the young beauty enthusiasts. Those were basically the, like, 12-year-old girls who go in and buy the cheap makeup in the teen magazine, right? They have a whole different behavior towards coupons. But I think a lot of times the machine learning community, because they're not trying to explain their model results to people, they're just trying to publish it, don't really focus on that. Um, thank you. Um, Eric, so you're, you're um, working on leveraging big data for healthcare and life sciences, and um, 
IBM Watson works with clinicians and other healthcare providers. Do you think those challenges are unique or shared by academic researchers? So you, you work with actual healthcare providers, you provide solutions. Many academics try to collaborate with people in medicine. Do you think that there is that the challenges that you share are unique or are you able to to have fewer challenges because you have all of the infrastructure behind IBM to do it with? Is that clear? It's clear. I thought that was the second question you were going to ask me, so I had my first answer ready. Um, I changed the, the order. Yes, you did. That's okay. I can adapt. Um, the, uh, I think that the, uh, the challenges are, um, there, there are probably some similarities and some differences. So as a, as a company working directly with uh, hospitals, providers, payers, etc., uh, I think we get a little more insight into the actual workflow and uh, as a computer scientist and only working in the healthcare space for about four or five years, one thing I've discovered is that healthcare is enormously complex. Anybody who works in that industry will say that, but if you're on the outside, you're skeptical and you say, well, every job is complex, but healthcare is, is really different because not only is, is medicine uh, complicated and hard, and you're dealing with practitioners who have gone to uh, four years of college, four years of medical school, and then another three years uh, or four years of additional training after that, who believe they know ex exactly what is the right thing to do. They, that's what they've been trained to do. That's what their patients expect them to be able to do. So you have that whole group of people practicing. You layered on top of that is this very complex payment and reimbursement process, particularly in the United States. And uh, a lot of the infrastructure has been built up to support that, including the electronic medical record. And so anybody that's doing big data analytics on patient records really needs to appreciate that that data has a particular bias associated with it. And in particular, electronic medical records were originally built to support the workflow, the coding, the payment, and reimbursement process. And so, in fact, in Watson Health, we have a, a company we acquired called Truvin, which has enormous expertise in big data analytics over all that payment data. And when I talk to those data scientists, they say, we get the best risk stratification and predictive modeling out of that data. Then I talk to physicians, who we also have at IBM, and they say, that billing and coding data is completely inaccurate. You cannot get good models out of that. You need to go to the clinical data. Of course, the Truven folks will say the clinical data is also inaccurate. It's the billing data. So it's, again, it's a complex situation with a variety of perspectives. Uh, and so I think when you're trying to uh, serve that community with real offerings, these are some of the challenges that you face, which might be a little bit different than academic research. Uh, so to make the academic research more relevant, I think it's important to partner with practitioners who can uh, communicate some of the real challenges that you have here. I think Columbia here has uh, a, a, norm, a, a, a nice resource with the Biomedical Informatics School in the connection with Columbia Presbyterian where you can evaluate uh, what you're doing in a real world situation. And so uh, I, I would say the, the common uh, challenge here is to apply all of these techniques grounded in real-world applications with insight and feedback from actual practitioners. Interesting. So this actually is very related to my um, next question for Chris, which you talked about a little bit on your first answer. And uh, we'd be very curious to hear what you do with the results of what you've learned from the data on content produced by the way that uh, readers navigate and consume the content. Can you share like a specific um, an anecdote and then tie it to the question of whether there needs to be more research with respect to how to operationalize glean knowledge from the academic community? Uh, sure. So the first one's easier to answer. I can certainly give some ex examples. Um, um, one newsroom example is uh, in 2014, uh, the New York Times put out a, a report, which is usually just called the Innovation Report, and it, it made clear at the beginning that there was a distinction between journalism and, and the art and science of audience development. That is, there's journalism, and then there's making sure that people read your stuff. 
And 100 years ago, people read your stuff because you gave them a dead tree, and then they sat down at their newspaper on Sunday, and they leaped through the leaves of the dead tree. And now they are getting the news in the palm of their hand, and they're often getting it not even in your app. You know, they're getting it via some social feed, and then they click through that social feed to engage with part of it. So the craft, art, and science of making sure that people read the journalism has changed dramatically. So one of the things we worked on was how to figure out which stories to promote at what time and on which social channels. So from the machine learning perspective, that's a really interesting predictive analytics problem or maybe a reinforcement learning problem. And you can build predictive models for how much engagement, variously quantified, you will get with a story if you do promote it and if you don't promote it, or if you promote it on this channel versus that other channel. And once you have that, then you can you know, build an algorithm and you can report some predictions. But I can't get editors to open up Python. So the whole machine learning challenge is married to the data product challenge, which is how do I build a, a, a digital product that, I, that these people are willing to integrate into their workflow? So we realized at the time that the newsroom had really um, embraced Slack Slack is like IRC, it's like IRC, it's a, it's a chat room, except you can program it, and it's very easy to program Slack bots. So instead of asking them to close Slack and open up a new web app, we built a Slack bot, which is like a command line interface to our machine learning algorithm. So we, we called it Blossom, which is sort of a, a friendly and non-threatening um, tool, right? Instead of calling it, you know, HAL 9000. <laughs> and we, we gave it lots of, lots of Easter eggs. You know, you could ask it to draw you a map or, you know, do whatever. And then you can also ask it, okay, what should I be posting right now on Facebook? And it would give you a, a quantitative score, a qualitative answer if you want. Or you could ask Blossom to remind you every now and then, like, hey, you haven't tweeted lately on the arts channel. This would be a great story to share on the arts channel right now. So that's an example of, of, of a way we were able to put digital engagement to work uh, to help the newsroom. I couldn't help but think about marketing when you brought up the story of conversion because the marketing department at, at the New York Times is full of people who want to answer the same questions like what is it about the way somebody uses the product that seems to indicate this person is going to become a loyal user? What is it about the way the subscriber is using the products that indicates this person is about to cancel? And again, they want to know both who are the at-risk people, which is sort of a tactical question for which you want a predictive model, and they want to know what are the risky behaviors, which is a strategic problem for which you want an interpretable model. So I, so I definitely empathize with wanting to give somebody from product or from marketing a very interpretable tree, a tree that you can talk through uh, and give them a sense for um, something that makes sense. And yet you can sleep well at night because it has a very good AUC. And so you sort of balance between predictive power and interpretability. Um, thank you. Uh, Rachel, in your current company, Wevo, it's trying to understand human decision making, which is really messy. How do you ensure that you're capturing that messiness and volatility of human emotion and decision making? What are like the features that you collect for, for that? Um, yeah, so that first thing I want to say we're available. Our yeah. startup is available. Um, my CEO would be angry if I didn't say that. Um, yeah, so we're trying to basically solve the problem, right? So conversion is this like, idea, again, that you want someone to do something on your website. Right? And it's very different depending on the website. It might be just send for more information. It might be request a demo. Um, a lot of our clients are online universities right now, so they want... They want people to sign up. They want to get their, their phone number and their email address, right? Then they can sort of further market. And so what they do is they want to try out different web pages. This is something that goes way back. They call it A-B testing. You put up one web page. You put up another web page. One does better than the other. You have a winner. Done. So first of all, it's a very expensive process, right? You need to put up two web pages, often the conversion levels are very low, like one or two percent. So if you have to think about how many people you need to sample to come to those web pages to get a statistical significant sample, it's very lengthy and et cetera. So what we're trying to do is basically bypass that step. So we do it two ways. We have a bunch of machine generated features, which are, is the page cluttered? You know, does it have this sort of format? Is this information on it or not? What is a navigation so complicated that people will get lost? But we also have a lot of human-generated features. So what we're doing is we're going out to the target audience 
and we're asking them questions like, do you find this page credible? And then we, what we're doing is building a model from that. For example, for an online university, if the page is not credible, does it have testimonials? Does it have accreditation? Um, and putting those two things together and the type of purchase, right? So some of the, the sort of purchase of, let's say, someone buying, I don't know, a mug is a whole different type of purchase than someone signing up to continue their education. Often, you know, it's an emotional response, right? So we're trying to put all of that together and build a model for each industry from that. Oh, thank you. So, um, Eric, in the health If I can inject one thing. Oh, you may. My, my CMO would be upset if I didn't respond with, well, we're hiring. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, all right, all that networking aside. Um, Eric, uh, in the healthcare field, are the challenges more technical, legal, or cultural? And how might the Northeast Big Data Hub help with these challenges? Good question. Uh, I think actually this morning we've already seen uh, a number of examples of some of the challenges dealing with healthcare data and particularly data that might have uh, protected health information in it. Uh, all the issues around security, how do you de-identify data, um, and just as a quick side comment, uh, I think statistical de-identification techniques for structured data are pretty mature and, uh, well, at least I read an article about them in CACM recently. I, I tried to find it, uh, but uh, for the life of me, couldn't track down where it was, but it was in the last year or two. A very nice article on that. Automatic de-identification of text I will claim right now that it's impossible. Um, I can give you examples of uh, data we've worked with that use state-of-the-art techniques and data gets corrupt and suddenly there are strange characters prefixed or prepended to a person's name and it completely escapes the system. But when a human looks at it, oh, that's a name, I just ignore the first three characters. So things like that will come up over and over again. Um, but uh, so that's, that's an ongoing challenge. Um, I think in uh, working with, again, all of the stakeholders in this space, it does become uh, quite a bit of a cultural challenge and uh, giving people confidence in the techniques. On administrative data, I, I think that's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, the techniques are well understood and the results kind of speak for themselves. But when you get to the clinical side and trying to support the practice of medicine, Physicians need evidence uh, and need to understand what's going on. Um, this is actually uh, going to become a very complex topic. Uh, most medical devices, as you probably know, go through a very, fairly rigorous process of um, clinical studies, these randomized double-blind studies, and FDA approval. And so clinicians rely on publications of these studies in their respected high-quality journal, journal articles before they use them. As you get into big data analytics that are more predictive and are supposed to support uh, diagnosis or coming up with treatment recommendations, I think there's a, a whole different challenge around how you demonstrate the efficacy and safety of these things. And even working with the federal regulation companies like the FDA, how do you educate them on what's going on with these systems, especially if they involve any kind of machine learning? Uh, they think. There's enormous uh, misconceptions about how machine learning works. There's, uh, you know, even with very senior administrators, this concept that if they install something with machine learning in it, it will just start going off on its own and, and be completely out of control, completely ignoring the fact that you can have policies that are completely orthogonal that control every aspect of how the technology actually operates. And educating uh, regulators around this is an enormous challenge. In terms of how uh, academics or academia can assist in this, um, I think the more we're able to publish meaningful, uh, large-scale studies on this to help people see the value, the efficacy, and the safety, and understand the details of how they work, uh, the better off we are. Um, thank you. So I, I do have a few more questions I could ask. but. I want to open it up to the audience to ask questions because, Renee, I do believe we end at 1.50, right? Uh, we, we have a little bit more time. Our, our next folks are in transit, so we have time Okay. Well, I have plenty of questions if you all are shy. 
I'd like you to do two things when you ask a question. The first is direct it to a particular person because it's far more interesting to get a lot of questions. And the second is, is that questions should be short. Answers should be longer. Yes. And um, do we have a microphone? During the first answer, you indicated that uh, the date the doctor says this data should be useful. Uh, if I remember, three groups, the doctor, the insurance company, and the third group, each of them saying, this data is good, that data is not good. I was thinking that they all could be right. For question A, to answer the profound question A, clinical data is relevant. To answer the profound question B, perhaps the insurance company then, depending on what, what the question is, and certain part of the data could be useful to answer that question. I just wanted to see if you make a little bit more clarification here. Thank you. So, I, right. So I think that's actually a, a great observation, is that you have different kinds of data, uh, different sources of data, and uh, even different modalities of data that we can potentially leverage here. Uh, so um, hybrid or ensemble approaches that can do the analysis across all of these things uh, can be useful. And maybe even coming back to Carla's question about the role of academia, uh, recognizing that these different kinds of data may produce different signals and have different outputs uh, can be validated in, in some sort of experimental setting to then ad provide guidance on what to use when and where. Uh, you know, the other thing I... It, because the answer is supposed to be longer. The other thing I'll, I'll add. The question was a little long. Is it, it was, but um, so just one final point is, you know, in my experience as a researcher, uh, I've found that you know it, it can be easy to to identify a publishable result, uh, but that result may not be so useful in a much larger system, and so uh, I, I would ask that. Uh, and this is a value of a, a larger collaboration, is to have the investment and resources to create larger scale systems so that you're really measuring end-to-end -end outcomes and ensuring that that component that you're working on when you produce a statistically significant improvement actually has impact on the larger problem you're trying to solve. And while it's interesting to publish on these little units, if they don't actually make the whole thing work better, it's much less interesting. So can people start to raise their hands? And I'm going to ask our, um, while the microphone is getting them, I'm going to ask for a one-line comment from each of you. What is the most interesting thing in one sentence that you've discovered as a data scientist in each of your roles or that your company has discovered? You can think about that for when we, when we have downtime. Go ahead. Just think about it. Uh, yes, so the question is uh, for um, um, Chris, uh, given the, yes, <laughs> given the overall climate of our country in, in, in recent months, um, what do you think is the role or potential, is there a role for data scientists to, uh, to contribute to improve our overall climate, working perhaps with journalists. <laughs> Can you identify the real news? <laughs> hmm. Golly. Um, As an individual and not for the New York Times, what do you think? <laughs> I, I mean, there's many ways to answer that question. Like, uh, let's go back to Jefferson, who said, given the choice between functioning government and fun functioning press, he would rather have a functioning press, right? Because the functioning press leads to the functioning gov uh, government. So I don't see evidence that that's changed. I, I think it's useful to have a very functioning, independent journalism function in your country. Uh, so that I would say is not news. Um, data scientists can be useful there because as I mentioned earlier, any company that has a website, which is to say any company, has abundant data about the way people are engaging with their product. And so it would be useful to put those data to work, not only to improve the product, but not to go out of business, uh, which is another goal of companies. So 
I think data science can be useful there. Um, my colleague asked about whether you can spot fake news. I will uh, respond by quoting somebody not in the room. So there was a Jan LeCun uh, interview from December where he was quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying, uh, of course, when it comes to spotting fake news, that technology either exists or can be developed, but whether or not we should do so at Facebook, that's not my department. That was his quote. So um, Jan is on record as saying that in fact we can spot fake news and we should await somebody who's Jan's boss to uh, ask him to do so. Uh, so apparently, yes, that is a solvable problem. It's certainly more solvable if you work at the place that has all of the data and 90% uh, of all of the digital advertising spend in the world right now and uh, plenty of the data scientists. So we could spot the fake news, but um, spotting the fake news, I, I think, is not the problem. Right. I think there are other things that you can do to ameliorate the impact of fake news. Did you want to comment on anything? Well, I mean, my uh, I, the reason I kind of threw that out there is because I have this hope that with the kind of analytics that we're using, we can actually support facts. And um, it, uh, it wasn't a, a criticism of the, the media. It was more, you know, how do we leverage this to provide evidence to support factual information so that people make uh, you know, sound arguments based in fact. I, I do know that from um, students of mine that work at TripAdvisor that they can spot fake reviews. Next question. Hi, this is a question for Chris. Uh, Chris, my question was when you implemented your call the, the bot, um, did you consider advocating for organizational reward or punishment to add information um, through someone's workflow, or did you go straight toward the technology solution of being able to pull that information from their existing workflow? Gosh, I'm sorry to respond to, with, a, with a question to your question. Um, what, did I advocate for punishing people? No, you, you, you said, would you consider advocating for using characteristics to be more participatory, add information to what you're trying to get, or did you simply say, let's scrape this off your existing workflow? Was there a Oh, so th um, that's not my department. No, so. Um, so so the New York Times actually created an audience development group in September of 2014, and that was the challenge they posed to a bunch of journalists: is keep in your head the 600 or so URLs we've put out in the last 24 hours, and the you know 20 to 30 social media channels, and the 96 15-minute increments of the day, and figure out how to do the matching among all of those things. So I didn't have to incent people to use those things because that assignment is already a pain in the ass. And it doesn't really matter how good your news judgment is, that's just too much for any human being to keep in, in your head. So I, I was working with people who really wanted the problem solved. Um, but I, uh, a related question, which you didn't ask, but I will answer, is I, I think it's very dangerous to try to use data science as a management tool. Um, you know, trying to use data to quantify people's performance and then rank them and then fire people based on the, some quantitative metric. That is a very old subject in statistics, you know, as old as, you know, one of the first usages of PCA was to take a bunch of people's different performance on classes and try to create a G factor for their intelligence, presumably so you can fire people with low values of that. Um, I, I, I'm very skeptical of data science as a, as a tool for, for people management. I think it's far better to for example, when you're hiring faculty, it's useful to read their papers and not just count how many they have. Um, so as they say, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So uh, in terms of incenting people to use the tool or something, I, I stayed away from and was never asked to use the tool to rank order people's value to the journalism based on how much they tweeted or something like that. Well, we're waiting for the mic to go over there. Did any of the three of you uh, decide what your most important contribution ever was? You said surprising. Surprising. Oh, all right, I'll give mine. So I did something called trip narrative for a large airline. They were trying to figure out from basically the minute you bought your ticket that you flew and whatever, and you left the airport and they lost your bag and whatever, were you gonna complain or not? 
Um, and if you were, and you were an important customer, could they sort of head it off by giving you a free drink or a free flight, depending on how important you were? Found people who fly Monday mornings are huge, huge whiners. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, this question is for Eric. Uh, you mentioned the rigorous process around medical devices and peer reviews and other rigorous process for medicine. What happens when machine learning starts to change the way we diagnose and treat illness if it can't be peer reviewed or checked by humans necessarily because it's dealing with giant data sets? Oh, so, good question. And I think uh, there's, there's a couple of elements to this. Uh, so. Even if you have an, a, a technique that is based on machine learning, you can treat it like any other device and run large-scale studies on that and measure its efficacy and safety that way. Um, uh, so you can certainly do that. I, I think where it starts to get a little more complicated is they, these systems differ from deterministic or rule-based systems where you can, as a human, reason about the steps that it's going through and come out with the expected outcome. And so as anybody who works with these statistical techniques or machine learning techniques knows, there's a whole methodology for how you go about training, testing, and evaluating these systems. And I think uh, it just means that uh, we have to formalize that process and make it, uh, make it much more easy to apply and much more um, uh, foolproof to apply and make it easy for every, everything, everybody to understand what's going on. Um, I will, you know, I will admit, and this was actually maybe a surprising, not so much a data science thing that was surprising, but, you know, I work in a large research institution with a lot of PhDs. Even sometimes those people forget that when you're training a system, you really ought not to be testing on your training data. Uh, so, you know, there, there are, you know, simple things about how you manage your data and then how you uh, run your experiments, and then how you validate them and test them. And some of this is at the component level, and then of course when you have the overall system, you have to run these larger scale studies and make sure you're uh, doing them with enough power so that uh, everything is meaningful. Um, and then one, one last thing I'll mention is uh, how do you use the results? And so a whole nother topic here, which was mentioned a little bit this morning, is visualization. How do I interpret what's coming out of this? And I think that can be, a very important component of how these things are ultimately leveraged in a meaningful way, uh, especially if how they work underneath is a little bit opaque. The visualization can help the human who's using it leverage that information in a collaborative way to ultimately make the best informed decision possible. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Um, just uh, thanks. This is an excellent panel, very insightful. Um, I have a question for Chris. Uh, you started to touch on this before. Uh, but if a company is at early stage of a data science journey, could you go a little further on commenting on what, what starting assumptions have turned out to be the most true and what have turned out to be not true in your experience? Mm. So when I talked about a company starting their journey, I was really talking about the fact that you need the data engineering to be solid before you can do interesting data science. Um, but in terms of assumptions that were true or not true, um, hard to state something generally. I, I can think of one thing I had, which is when we were looking at engagement data and trying to do things like predict which, which visitors would become subscribers and which subscribers would be retained, I immediately thought we should throw away all of the self-reported data, like when you have a pull-down menu and you say, I'm a banker, or I'm a candlestick maker, or whatever, and I'm you know, 48 or whatever. Um, but to my surprise, those data turned out to be really useful, the self-reported data, which surprises me because I always say I'm from Azerbaijan and I'm, and I'm zero years old and I'm, I'm, an, I'm an accountant because those are at the There's top. There's a profile for you out there. Uh, Rachel, I'm interested in your take on that same question because you worked with so many companies when you were at Opera Solutions that um, I, I have two parts to the question that are highly related. The first is how many of them had never really done data science and they were bringing you in and then can you answer in the context of that the same question that, that Chris got because you've had a whole swath of companies that you worked with? Um, so 
There are definitely, most of the companies we work with were like Fortune 100. So I'd say they had some kind of data science in the company, but not necessarily the people that we were working with. Um, so we did one project where we ended up using an SVM to model um, whether people would be upgrading or not. Um, upgrading their to a first class ticket, right? So they have a, they want people to upgrade, but and if they get to the airport and they haven't upgraded, then they really want people to upgrade because they want to fill their plane. And so they give you a lower price. But people who fly a lot know that. <laughs> and they want to make sure that they don't wait until the last minute because then they make less money. And so we had used an SVM and the um, executive was extremely impressed and wanted to buy very, very many SVMs for his company. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, there's, there have definitely been cases like that, but within his company, there were certainly others who had used them. I think the biggest, the biggest thing we've seen is making people move from sort of their small in-memory tools, SAS, R, Python, to make them move to the Hadoop cloud, where instead of subsampling their data, they can actually use it all, right, and segment it in different ways, you know, high value, low value, this population, that population. And that sort of data science, I think, has been new to a lot of them because, because the tools are new. Do we have another question? So this question uh, is to Eric. Um, for when we're doing data analytics around high stakes decisions where we're attempting to make recommendations, such as in health, but in other areas such as like self-driving cars as well, right? It's this idea of at some point the algorithm is either gonna make a decision or make a strong recommendation that has life or death consequences for the people that it's interacting with. To what extent has, have you guys been talking about like how should these algorithms be open, auditable, able for people to understand so it's not like some kind of opaque, as you were saying before, an opaque like Bayes type of you know, machine learning you know, black hole, but rather something we can look at publicly and understand how this is going to make high stakes decisions on people's lives. Good question again. Uh, so the, the openness, uh, of course, for any commercial entity is, is always a bit tricky uh, because um, these things could be proprietary, they could be your intellectual property, it could be your, uh, you know, the, the secret sauce in what you're doing. And so uh, I think in the ideal world, there would be ways to validate you know, the efficacy, the effectiveness, and the safety of these things without having to peel it open too much and expose exactly how it's doing. Um, and to today, you know, some of these techniques, let's say you use some deep learning technique with, I don't know, how many ever hidden layers or whatever, it, it becomes almost in, uninterpretable by anybody. Uh, the only way that you can validate it is with a large-scale experiment to show that it's doing the right thing. Uh, there are, again, regulatory agencies that really want you to be able to explain what's going on. You know, n n set aside healthcare, even in uh, the financial space, if you want to come up with models for predicting credit card churn, there are expectations that you're going to expose how that's being done because they want to make sure there aren't any uh, you know, biases based on demographics, for instance. But if it's just statistical data driven, it, it, it's doing what the data is doing. Uh, now, you, maybe your data is biased and you want to expose that as well. Uh, stepping back a little bit, one way to address this is to make sure that you design the overall application in a way that is tuned for the level of performance that these components give it. So my personal experience in that would be with this Jeopardy system where um, the system was not going to be perfect and the life or death situation was that if it crashed on TV, I wouldn't have a job. And so we made sure we designed the whole end-to-end -end system to anticipate certain uh, failure modes. And in particular, if the system can produce a confidence level in its response, you can incorporate that into how it's leveraged in the overall solution. So when you watch Jeopardy, did you need like some kind of like Valium to keep you calm so that it wouldn't crash? Or I think we were really all very tired by the time it, <laughs> it happened. When, when it was playing or just when I watched Jeopardy in general? Like a, a uh, 
while yeah, while your a, system was playing a trigger thing. So, if you if you may not know that the whole three day thing was taped in one afternoon, actually up in Yorktown Heights, in January, and so the whole technical team was there in the audience along with a bunch of IBM executives and their their guests. And if you watch the exhibition match, the camera would occasionally pan the audience. Everybody is having a lot of fun and a good time, except for that team in the lower left corner that is looking very stern and nervous. And that was the technical team. <laughs> we have time for perhaps one more question. And um, how about, how about, uh, or back there, wherever. Yeah, back there. Was there someone back there? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh my question is, I guess, to Rachel because she mentioned you mentioned the descriptive data science, and I and I want to know how you. I want, my question is, how do you think about where to where to stop and where maybe decide that that's actually there is nothing there to you know that the data can explain. That's a difficult, I think, uh, task compared to testing, where you can just test your prediction, you know, whether it works or not. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point, right? Sometimes your model just doesn't show anything, right? So I think one thing to consider is there's always humans also part of this, often very much experts in their field, right? Domain, domain experts. And so sometimes you'll say, well, this model shows nothing. And at that same large pharmacy, they had accidentally categorized soft drinks as toothpaste, right? And so, you know, I think sometimes sometimes being able to look at your model in a descriptive way helps you sort of validate it on a human common sense level. I think sometimes it's a, a question of just changing the features. Again, if it's human readable, um, for example, in this transactional um, situation, it can be how many times did you do it in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, they might say, oh, that doesn't make sense. Right? So I think it's not just a, if it was successful or it failed, but basically, do we need to do another iteration? I think if the humans can predict it, the computers generally can too. It's just, do we have the right features? So I'd like to close with the anecdote. So we have that people who fly Monday mornings are a pain in the neck. We have that even trained machine learning people can sometimes still do their testing on the training data. And Chris, what would yours be? Most surprising thing, little nugget. Um, I think this. I think the thing earlier that some people actually report accurately what they're jobs are when they have online forums. Not being zero years old yeah, and being a candle maker. An, an accountant from Azerbaijan. Which is <laughs> well, on that note, I'd really like to thank our panel. This was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.